Hi, we're going to uh, try to conclude our series on the Roman world with an introduction to Cicero. Cicero is a central figure in the late Republic as the, in the last dying days of the Roman Republic. And as we are looking into the empire that was born through the takeover by Octavian, who became Augustus. But Cicero was a major figure in the uh, as the Republic is, is coming to an end with Julius Caesar and uh, Gaius Pompey, the rivals for uh, power. Pompey allegedly was more friendly to the Senate, but we don't really know. Um, Caesar basically wanted to reinvent Rome, and, uh, and he had a lot of good reasons for wanting to do that. But Cicero was the strong, staunch defender of the Republic, uh, even to his dying day. So we want to look at him, uh, not so much because of, of his political life and things like that, but because of his writings. His writings were preserved and passed on to subsequent generations. And uh, we are uh, indebted to him for a great many of our ideas, especially in this country, in the United States, but also other republics around the world uh, owe a lot to Cicero in terms of their um, the underlying values that they see as important for the whole concept of representative democracy. But not just that, Cicero was a, uh, wrote a lot on philosophy and also wrote, wrote on uh, moral ethics and things like that. So his treatise on duties, which was written to his son who was in college and doing a lot of partying, <laughs> um, was uh, written to him to basically remind his son, hey, there's more to this world than you. It's not all about you. There's a lot of other things you have to take into consideration. And you have some responsibilities here, and you need to wake up to those. So that's kind of what uh, the On Duties is about um, in, in the short term. In the long term, it's about being a good functioning uh, part of your community and your society. And what are the things that you have to do for that? So we're going to look uh, briefly at his life and, uh, and then his career, and then we're going to focus on other aspects of uh, Cicero. And uh, this is not wanting to, there it goes. Uh, we've got some lag here, apparently, and uh, if you'll excuse that little circle down on the left, I'm not sure what's going on with that, but uh, uh, we will continue regardless. So uh, Cicero was born in, uh, you know, just at the turn of the century, the last century of the uh, era before the birth of Christ. And uh, he did what a number of wealthy Romans did. They sent their sons to college, um, if you will, uh, across the Aegean Sea to Greece. Not the Aegean, I'm sorry, the Adriatic to Greece. And uh, where they would get the best tutoring and uh, the best education in uh, the classics and philosophy and things like that. The Romans, as we recall, uh, didn't have a lot of stuff that was original to them. They borrowed a lot from other traditions. And even in the Aeneid, which we just saw, this story of the Aeneid didn't actually exist uh, in the way that Virgil created it. He sort of created the idea that they had an origin story. Um, you know, we've got... <laughs> in the uh, Marvel and DC universes, uh, comic book universes, they're always doing these origin stories. Well, Virgil basically does the origin story for Rome, but um, kind of makes it up. Uh, and uh, But he has to build on the foundation that was created by Homer and uh, other Greeks. And he makes constant reference to them in his story because that's what the Romans know. That's what they've all grown up with. So to get the best education, you went to Greece. And so Cicero went to Greece and was educated there. Uh, he was uh, did the whole cursus honorum, which uh, we had talked about in the earlier lecture, which was what you did if you wanted to be, um, you know, sort of the, the stepladder uh, that you did as a public servant in Rome. And so he did that whole thing. He was from a lesser family, not from one of the, uh, the long-term historic wealth families in Rome. His family was from just outside of Rome, but through that um, uh, patronage and clientage that I mentioned before, he was able to get, his father was able to secure him a good patron, 
And because of this, he was able to move into the regular life of the equestrians in Roman society. And so he became uh, the quaestor in Sicily, which is basically a governor of the island of Sicily at a relatively young age, which is a remarkable achievement for him. He was uh, 31. And uh, that's kind of when his, his career kind of really takes off. Uh, he becomes an adil, which is a very important uh, ceremonial position in Rome, uh, then uh, ends up becoming the praetor in Sicily uh, in 66. I'm sorry, the quaestor was a different uh, underling position, and then praetor is the government governorship. Then uh, just a few short years after that, he becomes the consul of Rome, which is the, the president. Uh, he's one of two presidents or prime ministers of Rome and which is a uh, pretty astonishing for a person of his status and he is able to achieve this is somewhat of a there were three candidates he was sort of the less known of the three candidates there was a uh, which you might call a stagnant uh, 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 standoff between the two leading candidates and he was able to sneak in as the uh, consul but during his time as consul he did achieve some important things for rome we'll talk about that in a minute um, as consul, he, and as a prominent figure, he made a lot of enemies. Those enemies got their revenge on him. In 58 BCE, he was sent into exile. Most of his property was confiscated, uh, by the state. Uh, it was almost like he was treated as a criminal. Um, he was, did get to return and was kind of reinstated, uh, primarily with the help of Julius Caesar. And so this is an interesting wrinkle in the story. Up until that point, he had been a vehement opponent of Caesar's, a uh, very strong pro-republic against any kind of um, usurpation by uh, the generals out there who were running the armies. And so Caesar and Pompey were the two big generals that were uh, Pompey in the east and Caesar in the west and, and conquering uh, France and Spain, which were what called Gaul and Hispania at that time. And then Pompey out in the east, who was busy with the Greeks and the um, Palestine area and Egypt. Well, they were kind of these two giants uh, who were, uh, you know, striding across Rome. And uh, the Romans kind of had to decide between the two of them. Uh, Cicero was a strong backer of Pompey. And, uh, but in order to get back into the good graces and back into being a contributing uh, politician in Rome, he needed money. And Caesar saw that he needed money. Caesar had tons of money from his conquests. And so he just came up to Cicero and said, hey, can, can I give you, can I help you out? And Cicero was like, well, I do need some money. And Caesar was like, don't mention it. Don't even consider it a loan. I'm going to make this a gift. And so he basically bailed Cicero out of his troubles, set him back up, and uh, which was interesting that Caesar would do that because he knew Cicero was was a foe of his in the Senate. But he did this anyway. But in doing it, he knew Cicero was a principled man. And because of his principles, Cicero then would not oppose Caesar publicly in the Senate. He would do some things behind the scenes, but uh, he felt that because he, even though he it was a gift. He felt that he owed a certain amount of gratitude to Caesar, so he would not come out against him publicly, which has a huge impact on Caesar's ability ultimately to take over in uh, in Rome. So uh, he becomes a proconsul in a backwater town, uh, Cilicia, a uh, governor there. He hates the job. Uh, he finally comes back. About the time he comes back, uh, just before that, he comes back. Caesar takes over in Rome declares himself dictator for life, and then is, uh, basically takes over. He, he defeats Pompey in a major civil war, and then um, he's assassinated by the Senate. And Caesar's successors, which included Octavian and Mark Antony, um, they hated, or Octavian didn't, but Mark Antony hated Cicero because Cicero uh, basically vented all of the spleen, all of the anger, all of the fury that he had against dictators. He had just kind of pent that up until the death of Caesar. And then he just explodes in a whole series of speeches against Mark Antony, in which he calls him all kinds of names. Um, 
and directly insults him. And Mark Antony says, uh, you're dead, dude. Uh, and so in 43 BC, um, Cicero was actually on his way out of the country because he knew he was toast. And uh, uh, Mark Antony's soldiers caught up with him there and uh, lopped off his head. And that's how, that's how he died. So his career, he um, referred to some of this already. In his early career, uh, Cicero made a name for himself as an attorney who would take up the cause of the voiceless. So people who did not have a chance, they were basically standing against very powerful men. There was a racket in Rome uh, by powerful men who would trump up charges against people who uh, had no way, no power to defend themselves. And in the process, they would get them declared criminals, get them thrown into jail and that type of stuff. And then their land would get confiscated. Well, these powerful men would confiscate the property of these less powerful individuals. And so Sextus Ruscius is one of these who they accuse of killing his own dad. And, um, uh, and he's about to go down and Cicero comes forward out of the blue and defends him and wins the case for Sextus Ruscius. Ruscius does not get his uh, lands back but he does get he does get declared innocent, which is interesting, uh, you know. And the uh, sort of a compromise: the rich people got what they wanted, the powerful people got what they wanted. But in the end, Ruscius got away with his life, and that's probably what Cicero told him <laughs> was, "Hey, dude, you're free and you're alive. Uh, count your blessings." But uh, Verres, the prosecution of Verres, Verres was a another uh, praetor in Sicily after Cicero. And he was corrupt. He was terrible. He just drove the people into the ground. Well, the people came back to Cicero and said, hey, help us out. Um, we need you to defend us against this guy. And so they sued him in Roman court. And uh, Cicero took his case and won the case. Again, he was not expected to win either any of these cases that he would take. But because of his incredible oratorical skills and his ability to uh, use a lot of humor, and he also um, would uh, make satirical comments about the people that he was uh, suing and uh, or, you know, that he was uh, his opponents in the courtroom. And, the, uh, you know, the juries found it very entertaining and they would basically uh, he was able to win in this way. Uh, when he became consul, there was actually before Caesar, there was another figure who tried to make himself dictator. His name was Catiline. Cicero successfully opposed him, successfully revealed a conspiracy to overthrow the Roman government and uh, had Catiline and his conspirators arrested and executed. And his series of speeches continue to be very famous today. And so um, if you're learning Latin, if you go to a classical school uh, and have to learn Latin, one of the orations you might have to memorize in Latin is the Catiline uh, from the Catiline orations. Um, but it's a, it's a classic work against tyranny and in favor of the rule of law and the citizenry uh, and would be referred to frequently by the founding fathers as well uh, of this country. What ends up getting him killed are the speeches that are referred to as the Philippics against Mark Antony, which was his final attack against tyranny. And uh, as I indicated here, it got personal. Um, he called uh, Mark Antony all kinds of things, including uh, uh, you're a pig, you're a, uh, you're a prostitute, you're a drunkard, you're a, he, he basically just he, no holes barred. He just went after him. And uh, Mark Antony said, uh, that's it. I can't take this anymore. And so um, it was an interesting uh, situation then where Octavian wanted Cicero to live. But our Mark Antony said, no, we aren't going anywhere. We're not doing anything until Cicero is dead. And so he succeeded in uh, getting Mark, uh, Octavian to say, okay, do whatever you want to do. Um, and so uh, they did have him put to death. We'll conclude this part and then uh, uh, commence with the uh, discussion about Cicero's books in the next part.